Uh, good morning, everybody. It's um, really fun to be here, and thank you for inviting me. I'm going to just uh, dim the lights a smidge because I have lots of images. Um, so, to show you. So, what we're going to talk about for the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes, is the pregnant patient. And rather than talking about the baby, we're going to be talking about the mom and things that happen to mom that you might need to image. Um, and really, from the standpoint of balancing risks and benefits, not only of imaging versus non imaging, but the, different, the differences between the different modalities. And the first part, we're going to spend mainly talking about the modalities, and not from the standpoint of whether or not you should do the imaging study, but which one you should do, because each of them have a risk and a benefit. I mean, even uh, modalities that you think are risk free have risks. So, even ultrasound, which is very safe, has risks. And CT, which is thought of as risky, actually has lots of benefits. And so that's what we're going to spend a few minutes in the beginning talking about. So ultrasound, yes, there's no radiation. It's very good for your solid organs, um, particularly good when you need to do some kind of procedure on a patient. And even when a patient has cancer during pregnancy, you can administer some local therapy for the patient. The risks are that you may not see things, and so ultrasound waves cannot penetrate bone or air. And so that's your risk, is that you can't see things sometimes, like the brain, because it's covered by bone, the lungs filled with air, and even in the abdomen, like the retroperitoneum, if you're looking for a retroperitoneal hematoma, all that bowel, if it's filled with air and you put your transducer down, you're not going to see anything in the retroperitoneum. So those are things that you just have to consider. What are you imaging? What do you want to see? CT, from a benefit standpoint, it's much more comprehensive. It can see the lungs, it can see the brain. You can use contrast because contrast, iodinated contrast is safe uh, with no known risks, even though it does cross the placenta. Um, but there's risks with CT. So radiation is the main risk. And so let's look at the radiation risk. And I'm not a physicist and I, I actually hate physics. So this is a hard topic to discuss, but I, I did learn this for today. So <laughs> there's two types of uh, damage caused by radiation, the deterministic and the stochastic. So the deterministic is there's a lot of radiation that occurs, and it has to be a very high dose, and then there is basically cell death, which either is the whole fetus or embryo or part of it, or like a malformation. The stochastic is kind of like um, you don't need this one-time big dose to cause DNA, basically DNA damage. And so when DNA gets damaged, you end up with some kind of cancer of some kind. And when I talk to patients, mainly what's been uh, noted in the literature is that there is this increased risk of childhood leukemia in fetuses that have been exposed to radiation. And so that's the main risk. And it's a relative risk. So background radiation, your chances of your child having childhood leukemia are 3 in 1,000. When you get up to 10 milligram, which is kind of diagnostic level, uh, CT mainly, uh, 4 in 1,000. And when you get up to 50 milligram, it's 6 in 1,000. And so I don't like numbers either. So I just remember 50 milligram is kind of your limit. If you go Above that, you're going to run into problems, and the two problems we just discussed, if you're less than 50 milligrams, for the most part, you're okay. So what does that mean in terms of your imaging? This is a reference table, and I have the references in the slides, and the slides are available uh, via Jessica, or maybe online, posted online somewhere, or you can just email me if you need the references. I'm happy to send this talk to you. Um, and my name is Elizabeth Sadowski, in case anybody missed that, you can find me on the, on the email. Um, so if you look at this list, I just wanted to point out that things that you might think are pretty risky, like a chest CT and abdomen and pelvis, it really depends. So like abdomen and pelvis is between 8 and 25 milligram. So like the 8 is way below 50, right? It's even below 10. And I will tell you that if we modify the protocol like for a flank pain CT, 
it's closer to one to two milligrams. And so we can really get down in that radiation dose if we need to. And 25, if you're up to 25 range, you're usually getting things like angiograms of the patient or something like that in the abdomen. But if you get a chest CT, you're not even above a milligram. Same thing for the head. You're not above a milligram and a mammogram. And I bring up the mammogram because I know some patients um, who are pregnant have BRCA and they have to get screening. And there's sometimes this pushback to not get screening. Not so much from your end, but maybe from the oncology end. But there's these references you can give people. And you have to be an advocate for your patient. And I try to advocate for women, too, that, you know what? If you need the imaging, you need the imaging. That's just the way it's not, uh, it's not as risky as people think, in my opinion. So here are a couple of references. And like I said, these are in the talk. There's many other references, too. So moving along to MRI. MRI is a newer modality. It's available, I would say, available and usable and gives you good information, I think, in tertiary care centers. I think if you're practicing out in the community in smaller centers, MRI is not always as beneficial because they have older machines and older, older technology. And in the last five years, there have been a lot of advances to basically make MR faster. So that's basically like CT and it freezes motion. And so the issue with MRI is the motion. So a lot of the images look blurry because it can't go as fast as a CT and so then you see the motion. That's kind of been resolved in the last five years, but that means you would have had to purchase these machines in the last five years and they're very expensive. And so it takes time for the community and the smaller um, places to get this. So that's just kind of my, caveat to MRI. And also, radiologists don't all know how to read MRI in pregnant women. And we do have a group of people here who do this, and I'll kind of list them at the end of the talk so you know who they are and who you can reach out to. But MRI is similar to CT. Um, you can see lots of things with it, including the brain and the lungs. Um, the only issue is that contrast currently is not recommended, and the reason is because gadolinium-based contrast is thought to be not safe uh, in the fetus. And not really from the standpoint of congenital anomalies and cancer, but because there's this relative risk of increased rheumatologic and inflammatory skin conditions, and supposedly an increase in stillbirths. I, I wanted to say that this is a big study, and it was published in JAMA, and this is what their results were. And they did account for a few things these patients have, but realized like a mom is not getting an MR with contrast if she's not sick, like something's going on. And so to tease out, was it the GAD or was it gadolinium or was it the sickness, like i.e. she was in a car accident because she was drinking or whatever, you know, you, they didn't tease that out. So I think, I don't know if this is gonna be forever, you know, that we can't give gadolinium, but for now, people don't recommend it. I do say, you know, obviously the mom, uh, the mom's health is important, and if you really, really need it, there's always a conversation that can be had about this, and you just discuss the risks so, to the fetus at that point. All right, so that's the imaging kind of basics. So moving along to the clinical cases. So, I'm going to go through cases to kind of talk about different things you can think about and consider when you have these patients. I'm going to try to stay away from the clinical aspect too much because I am not a clinician, but I do have a little bit of clinical data in here. Um, so first of all, um, I did a little research to figure out, because I had this question, like, how many pregnant women actually have like an acute abdomen and have to go to the OR? Um, so show of hands, how many people think one in a thousand? How many people think one in 500? How many think one in 100? Okay, so most people think one in 500. So I looked back into the literature and there really actually is not a lot of data on this. And I was back into the 60s and 80s, 1980s, and it was fluctuating, you know, some said a one out of 500, one out of 100. And then I found this uh, study from 2017 and this is from the UK registry. They looked at like six million pregnancies in the UK. And they figured out that 
about 50,000 women went to surgery for non-obstructional causes. So that's about one in 125. So somewhere between one in 100 and one in 500, which is, sounds pretty often to me, and probably everybody in this room has experienced dealing with this kind of patient, and depending on your practice, maybe many times already in your career. So definitely um, something that happens. And when this happens, on your end, you know, you're not just balancing the mom and the baby, but you're kind of balancing like what you should do, right? Should you wait? Should you do surgery? And while I was uh, looking in the literature, and I, like I said, there isn't a lot of literature on this, so you get to the bottom of the list and you're in like 1908, right? So in 1908, Dr. Babler, this was the concluding sentence of his scientific paper. And this was it, is that the mortality of appendicitis slash peritonitis complicating pregnancy is the mortality of delay. So basically, if you wait too long, it's not good, right? And so nowadays, hopefully, we have something in between waiting and surgery, and I think that's imaging. And so we're going to kind of focus on how do you use imaging so that you don't wait too long. And so you have lots of available modalities. Depends what you're looking for, right? So what are we looking for? So the most common causes of an acute abdomen are appendicitis, ovarian torsion, and cholecystitis, all of which are surgical for the most part. Um, I did notice that the rates of these is like one in 2,000 basically, yet um, we take women to surgery, you know, one in 100 to 100, 500 times. So some of those women going to surgery actually don't have these things. Um, and maybe they have something else, right? So there's other things that are not technically surgical in nature and you treat them differently. And they're much less common, and I did not find rates, but they're all listed in order of how rare they are. So there's a lot of non-surgical causes that happen in these women is what I've concluded from looking back into the literature to 1908. Um, so if anybody needs a research project, this isn't a bad one, because there isn't a whole lot written on this. And I think it'd be fun. Uh, and I'm not soliciting another research product, but I just thought I'd throw that out there because there's a lot of trainees here and a lot of mentors, and maybe you know somebody's interested in this. All right, so let's go to cases. This is a woman who's pregnant. She's 32 years old, and she's 32 weeks pregnant, and she's had this uh, right abdominal pain for a day, and it's been concluded that it's not related to the baby. The baby's fine. The placenta's fine. Everything's going along fine. And so they did an ultrasound, which is what you usually start with when you're looking for appendicitis in a pregnant lady or a young person, and that was negative. So then they went to the MR, and this is from Meritor when he gave me this case. So let's look at this MR. And so I'm showing you images basically so you see what we see, and so maybe you could look at these on your own too, um, because I think a lot of eyes is helpful. So. You can see a lot of anatomy that is probably familiar to you. The liver is up here, the spleen is up here. The stomach is filled with fluid, and this brightness is fluid. Um, and then all these kind of wiggly things are the bowel. All right, so lots of bowel and some fat. The fat is bright. And then there's the baby, and I, I actually love imaging babies, so let's just take a moment and look how pretty this baby is. <laughs> and then we'll get to the pathology. So, this is the kind of detail you can see on MR, right? So the brain, you see the nose, the lips. You actually see the palate here, and the uh, pharynx, and the trachea or esophagus there. The heart's this thing moving, and here's the baby's bowel, and stomach, and a little bit of liver. And um, it's really curled up in there, right? So that's what happens. So where's the pathology? Whoops. Whoopsies. Sorry. So pathology is we have all these wiggly bowel loops, but all of a sudden there's this kind of tubular structure. And I'm just going to run back and forth. So here is a tube, and it's filled with fluid. And if I follow it where my arrow is, it connects to the cecum in the right lower quadrant. So it's a blind ending tube filled with fluid, and it's dilated. And there's a little bit of edema, which is hard to see because the fat is bright. And if you fat, we can fat sat this, which I don't have for you, but uh, that would be edema. And so this is appendicitis. So now you know you have to go in 
or potentially have to go in um, to treat this patient. So this is obvious, right? Because otherwise, the appendix, if it was normal, would look like the rest of the bowel, kind of wiggly and decompressed. So that's how we figure out if it's appendicitis or not. This is just a companion case. You can see appendicitis on ultrasound. So when you're looking, um, and say you're, this woman is uh, 26 years old, 20 weeks along, so she's a little less pregnant, so maybe it was more easy, easily seeing the appendix, or maybe it wasn't covered by bowel, so you saw it. But basically, you're looking for a blind ending pouch, and you know it's bowel because it has a, what we call a bowel signature. And the bowel signature is basically you have a hypochoic outside, then hyper line, so hypo, hyper, and then hypo. And this, this kind of tri, triple little signature all the way around, that's a bowel. And if it's blind ending, it has a lot of uh, blood flow to it, and it's dilated, that's appendicitis. All right. Next case, this is somebody who's had epigastric pain and we were asked to rule out cholecystitis, gallstones. Um, they couldn't find the gallbladder on ultrasound. We're like, oh, okay, if you can't find it on ultrasound, I don't think we'll find it on MR. But let's do it. So we did it. And here's the liver, here's the spleen. And um, the gallbladder is filled with fluid, and so are the bile ducts. So that the bile ducts are bright here, they're not dilated. There is no gallbladder. So we finally, the residents finally like, well, can you ask the patient if she has a gallbladder? The patient does not have a gallbladder. <laughs> and this wasn't, this is ER. I mean, you know, there's lots of things going on. We get it. But what we noticed is that there's a lot of fluid up in the upper abdomen, and this this piece of tissue here, this is the pancreas, and there's a lot of white lines in the pancreas, which is edema. And so we said, well, can she have pancreatitis, because there's a lot of fluid in the retroperitoneum, and it looks like there's edema in the pancreas. And that is what she has. They drew an amylase and a lipase. So nothing surgically to do here. Um, and I think she has a baby somewhere. Oh, there's a baby. Yep. <laughs> Not as pretty as the last one, but ooh, the baby has to pee. Okay. All right, this is the last case, and then we'll move on. So 31-year-old, 26 weeks pregnant, she's got some red abdominal pain. Um, here's the MR. We did ultrasound, she had hydro. Many times pregnant women have hydro, right? So now we're looking for appendicitis, because they, they said, well, the hydro is due to being pregnant, right? So here is the right kidney, and yes, this is hydro, fluid in the kidneys. If you compare to the other one, you always got another kidney to compare to, that's abnormal, right? But there's also fluid around that kidney, and that ureter is very big. That's kind of wiggling around here. And right where it comes into the bladder, there's a black dot. And that black dot is a stone. So this was a stone, it was very small. Again, not no surgery necessary here. So I showed you a few cases, basically, mostly MR to help you look at the images. So you can pull up the images and look a little yourself. Um, but also to just remember that, particularly at Meritor at the UW, um, this is something we can do. And there's no contrast. And they're pretty fast, actually, and pretty accurate. All right. Moving along to a slightly stickier subject. So cancer in pregnancy, this is something that is unfortunate when it happens even outside of pregnancy, but very unfortunate when it happens during pregnancy. It doesn't happen very often uh, from the statistics I found, one in a thousand patients uh, who are pregnant are diagnosed with cancer during their pregnancy, and most of the time it's breast or hematologic in nature. Um, I think when patients are diagnosed with cancer, it is so rare that many times there's a lot of conversations that happen between different specialists and the radiologist is definitely part of that, or imaging is part of that. And so, you know, when you're thinking about how to diagnose the patient, or initial diagnosis, there's some imaging involved. When you need to stage the patient, there may be some different imaging involved. If it's truly cancer and you're gonna treat the patient, there'll be some imaging probably along the way if she's treated while she's pregnant. And then obviously, if she makes it to the end, there's gonna be when do we deliver the patient. And so at many time points, you might be reaching out to the radiologist to 
figure out what's the best timing, what's the best exam, things like that. Just a couple example cases of how hard these cases can be and how different they can be. And so this is a 38-year-old who's only 12 weeks along. She didn't have a, a mass on her cervix, but when they did the pap smear, there was some squamous cell cancer cells. So um, they did an MR without contrast. And so uh, just so you know, most cancers we can see in the pelvis at least without, cancer, without um, contrast. And so cervical cancer would be uh, visible on our non-contrast T2 weighted images. So this is the uterus with the pregnancy. This is the bladder. This is the cervix here. We have the anterior lip, the posterior lip, the cervical canal. And cancer would be great, kind of like the myometrium. And we see that the cervix is nice and black. And when we looked at, um, axially, it's this black donut. We don't see any, any soft tissue here. In the center, that's just mucosa, right? So we didn't see any visible cancer. And so, you know, the patient was counseled that it is the treatment of choice is to, you know, remove the cervix and or uterus. And obviously this is an issue because she's pregnant. This is a very wanted pregnancy. And so she basically asked if, uh, what happens if we follow her. And, you know, can't say, right? But we see no tumor. Squamous cell, um, for the most part, can be a little on the slow side. So I think the agreement was that we would follow two months or three months. So we did another one and we didn't see anything. And then we did one after that and didn't see anything. And then she delivered and was treated. And I don't remember what the final uh, size of the tumor was, but it was very small. I think it was definitely stage one. Um, so in this case, it worked out, but it doesn't always work out, and I think it's really hard to counsel patients on what to do in these cases. Um, sometimes you know what to do because it's way more obvious. So like in this patient, she's 16 weeks along, they actually saw a mass, we saw a mass. Um, so this is a larger uterus because um, she's more farther along. And then instead of a black surface, you kind of see this light gray stuff here. And Axially, you see a little normal black cervix here, but all this gray tissue is tumor. It's out into the parametrium, and she has some nodes. So this is a completely different conversation with the patient. Um, more unfortunate, I think, but uh, at least you know there isn't really kind of an option of waiting with this one. This was an interesting case that um, my friend gave me. Um, they biopsied and did the MR the day of the biopsy. So. They were getting the MR because they thought it was cervical cancer and it returned lymphoma. So lymphoma is not even surgical, right? And sometimes when it's low grade, you don't have to treat right away. And if you do have to treat, there's chemos you can give during pregnancy. So it really depends what the cancer is, what happens to the patient. Like this patient went on to deliver the baby and uh, then get chemo after that. So there's lots of information out there. I just gave you a couple of references. This is definitely not a common thing that happens. And every time it happens, I personally have to look stuff up. So uh, these are some of the references I use. All right, moving along to ovarian lesions. Um, a lot of us experience these, I think, and it's a, a topic that's common in women and in pregnant women. But the lesions I'm going to talk about today are not your follicles or physiologic cysts or corpus luteal cysts. I'm, talk, I'm going to be talking about lesions that don't go away, so they're non-physiologic. What do you do with that cyst or that mass that's there and doesn't go away that you find in a pregnant lady? So uh, ovarian masses that are persistent, i.e. not physiologic, happen in about 1 in 100 women during pregnancy, and the majority are benign. And there's a list of them for you here. Um, the reality is that ovarian cancer is very rare, and so thankfully only one in a thousand times are you going to encounter an actual ovarian cancer. But you want to differentiate that cancer from all these other benign uh, lesions. When do you find these lesions? These lesions are usually discovered when the patient has her initial dating ultrasound, or potentially when she has her anatomical survey at around 16 to 20 weeks. Um, I, I've been told that you want to time the surgery between 12 and 18 weeks, so you're kind of trying to figure this out, potentially within the sick, you know, between the time of the first trimester ultrasound and 12 to 18 weeks, or potentially right away because she's being imaged 
for her anatomical survey, and that's the time you want to actually do surgery if you have to. So sometimes this is a rush. Sometimes you can wait. So what do you use to image the patients? Well, initially you're going to find this on ultrasound, probably. And ultrasound is great at characterizing simple cysts and hemorrhagic cysts and dermoids. And if that's what you think it is, that's what it is. Because those are very classic lesions, and ultrasound is very good at telling you those things. Uh, particularly if they're smaller. And I, I put this up here because I think that the larger the lesion is, the harder it is to be sure that that's what you're looking at, because you're not seeing the whole lesion. And there can be particularly hemorrhagic cysts and endometriomas that, that have tumor in them, like they're actually not hemorrhagic cysts like follicles, they're like hemorrhagic cyst tumors that bled into themselves. So you have to be a little careful the larger the lesion gets. Here again, MRI can be very helpful. You don't have to contrast to characterize complex lesions. Um, but I, I will say that I think a lot of these techniques, again, are better done in a tertiary care center with people who know how to read these exams to get the best outcomes. So let's look at some of these interesting lesions, because I don't see these very often. I don't know how often you guys see these. So decision-wise endometrioma. So sometimes endometriomas have some endometrial tissue that decides to get stimulated <clears throat> during pregnancy. And they grow, and they look nodular, and they can look like cancer. Um, but then I, if you can tell that that's what it is, a deciduous endometrioma, you don't have to do anything because these go away, unless they're very big. So if they're you know, a small size, and you can tell that's what it is, then you can leave it alone. And so on ultrasound, when you look like, here is a lesion in the patient's adnexa, and we see these homogeneous low-level echoes, which tells us there's blood in there. And this is very homogeneous. Not like a hemorrhagic cyst that has all those septations in it and, and different fluid levels. So this is an endometrioma. But then there's these little nodular areas that may or may not have flow. So you're like, well, that's a little odd. So um, sometimes you can just say that's probably a deciduous endometrioma and move on. Um, I don't know if I'm that confident yet because I haven't seen too many of these on ultrasound. Um, but on MR, if you send it to MR, you're able to actually pick up the tissue architecture and be more sure it's a, it's a deciduous endometrioma. And so here's that endometrioma, this big white thing on T2. And on T1, it's bright because it's blood. And here's the nodularity we were looking at, and that's pretty bright. And so on your T2, just like in the cervix, you're looking for gray tissue. In the ovary, you're looking for gray tissue say it's tumor, so that's a good sign that it's not gray. Plus, you see the uterus is smushed here, and the patient isn't very far along, obviously, um, or the pregnancy is somewhere else. Uh, but the endometrium is very bright, and so it's the same color, and that's how you can tell it's endometrium. And you can do that in every sequence you get, the T1, the T2, and the diffusion-weighted sequences. And so you can be very sure that this is endometrial tissue you're looking at, and there's nothing dangerous here. So that's how we can use MR to be more definitive. Now this is a big lesion, and whatever happens with the patient, this might actually have to be removed anyways because it's so large. But the smaller they are, um, you can kind of just watch and wait. Here's a luteoma, which is another lesion of pregnancy that goes away post-delivery. Sometimes these are associated with hirsutism and masculinization during pregnancy. And again, you'll see this kind of uh, cystic structure with some nodularity that has some flow in it. Um, and then on the MR, it'll just look like benign tissue to you, or to the radiologist, or to you. All right, and then hyperreactional uh, T analysis, or basically hyperstim ovary, bilateral ovaries that have fecal luteum cysts that just kind of go crazy because of the progesterone. Um, molar pregnancies, multiple gestations tend to have these. These are also benign. They usually progress post delivery, but they can cause a lot of issues in between those two points. This is the one thing that doesn't go away during pregnancy. It's a luteinized follicular cyst of pregnancy. And basically, this is a totally simple cyst that just continues to grow and grow and grow. And it's still a simple fluid. There's nothing that looks dangerous about it, but it can continue to get quite big. 
And this woman, uh, who was a patient here, um, it just kept growing and growing, and eventually they had to take it out. So in what I could tell from the literature, most of these have to come out. Can you wait till after pregnancy? I think it probably depends how big it gets. All right, so now let's look at some things that um, maybe are not so benign. And so this is a 40-year-old pregnant female. She's six weeks along, and you find this kind of cystic lesion in her anexa. And the cystic lesion is black, so that means it's, it's just simple fluid. There's no hemorrhage in there, so it's not an endometrial one, not a hemorrhagic cyst. And then there's this thing. And is it like projecting in from the side? Is it like pushing into the cyst? Is it a nodule? I put some Doppler on there. There's no flow. So these are like, the, like what do you do with these lesions, right? You see soft tissue, there's no flow. You're like, huh, probably benign. Um, and Lisa Barlett and I just uh, published a paper on this. And when you look at these lesions, so lesions that are basically cysts that have something inside of them, like a really regular thick septation or a nodule, and they don't have any flow, what's the chances of cancer? And we found in our population here at the UW, it's about 7%. So not huge, but definitely possible, right? So what do you do with these? So you can obviously watch them when she's six weeks along, you can give her some time. Say it doesn't go away, it looks the same. What do you do? I personally think in these cases, you should probably go to MR sooner rather than later because the thing about this is like if it's benign, you're gonna tell on MR. And if it's malignant, you're also going to tell an MR, and then you can, I, I, you can counsel the patient earlier in her pregnancy on what to do. And so um, we went to MR, and this is the uterus here. This is actually it's a more complex cystic lesion than I'm showing here because I didn't show the whole lesion. So it's this whole thing. And then where the blue arrows are is this little spiculated soft tissue. These are papillary projections. So papillary projections are not good by themselves. But then on top of that, on the uh, ADC and the high B value, those papillary projections stay bright. And so we use the diffusion weighted images to figure out if there's restricted water. And if there's restricted water, that is usually a sign of tumor. So we were able to say that this is probably some kind of papillary tumor. And um, she did have this removed, and this is a borderline serious tumor. Here are just some more flagrant um, malignant lesions. Again, on the T2, you're looking for this lobular soft tissue. Here are bilateral lesions that are very bright on the ADC, and these are uh, serotoninic and colorectal nets. All right. So, Finishing up here, I think that um, there's a lot of things that need to be considered when you have patients, pregnant patients who need imaging beyond the fetus, and weighing, not doing anything versus doing something is hard. I hope you can reach out to us and talk about the different imaging things you can do or use some of these imaging things yourself, like ultrasound and CT and MR, um, to kind of figure out how and um, how to treat the patient. I think that, um, again, talking to one another is probably good in these situations. It is not terribly uncommon, but it's not terribly common either. And there is definitely a group of us that are kind of like the go-to radiologists for guy and OB, and this is the list. Some of us are at the university, myself, Jessica and Mark, and Tyler, Emily, Frank, Pete, and Vinny are here at Meritor. And we all kind of talk to each other via email or during conferences. And um, if we're not on call, uh, you know, people can reach out to us even when we're not on call. Um, many of us have cell phones, have given you guys our cell phones and things like that. We're happy to talk about cases. And definitely during the day, just reach out to us and we're happy to talk about things. And if things are, you know, if you're, you're not getting the exam you want or you think you want, just give us a call or you want us to look at something, we're happy to do that. All right, so with that, I'm going to end and thank you for your attention. I think I left a little bit of time for questions. All right, so we have a little time for questions and answers. Thank you so much, Liz. That was just fabulous. Um, over the course of my career, I've seen MR emerge and then, you know, become something that we order all the time. 
Um, and I noticed that you know you talked about CT, but then you didn't show any images of CT. So um, so I love MRs, I love public MRs, and I'm just wondering, you know, is there a situation where where on, on these lesions you would go to CT, preferentially over MR? I, I think I've, I've 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 gotten to learn sort of the you know what's better about each one of those, but you know, if you could just tell the audience, are there any situations where where you would actually prefer CT? over MR after ultrasound? I think um, from the benign standpoint, I think um, stones are a little easier to do on CT, like renal stones and ureteral stones. And now, um, you know, we have a flight pain CT, we call it low-dose, which is less than uh, one millisievert. And so that's just easier on call for the resident and even for faculty, I think, to read. So stones is the one thing that I might consider a CT before going to MR. Um, but I know it's hard sometimes to figure out if she has a stone or something else, so you're, it's a differential rate. Um, for bowel obstruction? Bowel obstruction, no. I think that uh, MR is really good for bowel obstruction. Is there any other benign, yeah, I'm trying to think of other benign things you might want a CT for in the abdomen. I think pretty much everything you can do on CT, you can do on MR. Now, in cancer patients, it's different. I think that, um, you know, the chest is not done as well on MR. And I think, like, if you have a patient where you need a good chest, you know, looking for pulmonary nodules, then CT is the way to go. Um, and so, in cancer patients, you, the surveys might be more CT-oriented. Or you might get a chest CT and then a abdominal MR. Here, we're very comfortable with MR. I think if you're elsewhere, and that's why I say, like, I, you know, everybody's going to go somewhere different to practice, you have to really figure out what the radiologist is comfortable with. Because if they're not comfortable with the MR, they might not perform the right sequences, and they might not be able to actually interpret either, so, or very well. So they might be more comfortable with CT. And what I would say five years ago, we were more comfortable with CT. Um, but now we've gotten to the point where I think we're even a lot of us are equally comfortable. Not everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Cleaver, yeah. And he was talking about a new technique you have, the volume now, and you really can't create all these folders on the MRI. So I was just wondering if you talk about that a little bit, and if you want to do that, what you want to set it back in the order of. I don't know about that. <laughs> Mark didn't tell me about that. <laughs> so, so, but I, I oh yeah, because I was like, we do different things. All of us do slightly different things. <laughs> and, and merging them together. I know we have that for prostate. And um, I mean, to set up a workflow, like if Mark's the one initiating it, then he's, he would be basically the one to talk to about what to order, how to order it, what to put. And it sounds like you know something. Yeah, um, okay. I, I, uh, we did this where I drew, and um, it was actually at least the research protocol, um, but I was a subject in that study, so. Um, and so the way it would work was um, you get the MRI first, and then the MRI images were kind of projected onto a screen, and then they would live scan you with ultrasound, and they would project ultrasound images onto the MRI at that same time, and it was all sort of being recorded. Um, so that you can kind of integrate exactly what you're seeing on the MRI with what's going on on the ultrasound. Yeah, I haven't heard of it being clinically used, but um, that was our protocol. It's, the MRI was first, and Mark, those images would be projected on the ultrasound screen. Mark is the head of ultrasound, so if it is a new technology, it definitely goes through him. So you discussed the uh, fetal risks from gandolinium. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about the adult risk, the risk to the mom and, uh, and the class action suit against contrast makers now that it's a uh, big deal? Sure. So, um, so we have done actually, I've done a lot of research in that topic many years ago actually. Um, and so gandolinium is associated with nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, some of you may have heard, in patients who have decreased renal function. And so, um, but the main players in that are certain brands, and 
Uh, we did have that brand year before 2007, and so we did have several cases. And so we looked at our cases just like everybody else around the country at that time. And um, realized, we realized that really it only happens in very sick patients, like patients who are inpatients, who have multiple organ failure, who have sepsis, or who've just been to sur major surgery, like the cardiac surgery. And really, we didn't find any cases in people who were outpatients or not very sick. And so we made a protocol initially, first of all, to change from the agent that causes it to another agent and also to limit the gadolinium we administered to very sick patients. And so we and then we studied that for 2007 to 2012 or something like that. And we um, pretty much, I think around 2,000 patients in the end had, that had renal failure, some of which were very sick actually, with the new agent that we tried and we never, and we haven't had any cases of NSS since. And I think other people, particularly in Europe, have done the same thing. And so my opinion, and I think the FDA has put limits on the ones that cause NSF for sure, and then the ones that I'm talking about, they're kind of like, well, it's theoretical, but nobody's ever actually documented a case with multi hands or EOVIST or any of the ones that are considered a little more safe, to, to my knowledge. And so our protocol here is that if you need gadolinium, you know, you just get one of these safer agents. And that's just based on our research and I think what some of the research around the world has shown. And that, that would be my opinion, that it's, it's for the most part safe. If you need it, even in real failure, you should give it. If you don't need it, don't give it, right? It's like any medicine, there's always a risk. I mean, I kind of like liken it to the chances of NSF happening in these agents, maybe like Steven Johnson syndrome and, and you know, any drug you get. Like, it's super rare, but you're not going to give a patient, you know, a drug they need because they're sick because you're worried about Steven Johnson syndrome that we hardly ever hear about anymore. So it's kind of that kind of, in my opinion, it's that thing, that kind of thing. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, we've spoken many times on the phone about Acritas. So um, we, we sent most of the MRs that we would send you would be for that. So yeah. um, can you tell the audience a little bit about why you want them before 32 weeks? How confident do you feel about an Acrita and Acrita? Sure. And what are the things that make you more confident or less than the cases that really help us? Yeah. So we have been learning with you over the years <laughs> on this topic because it isn't something that um, we see a whole lot of and we don't, uh, you know, we do get some feedback and we look at pathology, but it's, it, we don't do very many of these a year. From my experience, um, the farther along in pregnancy, the placenta gets very heterogeneous and very lobular. And those are the signs you're looking for to diagnose Accreta and Increta. Percrete is a little different because you see the, you actually see the placenta outside of the uterus. So percretas are not as tough for us, although some might differ in opinion. But I think the acretas and the incretas are very hard. And I personally, accreta, if it's a mild accreta, you may not see anything, right? So our sensitivity for acreta is not very good. For increta, it's pretty good. And for perforate, it's, it's, I would say, the best. And we're looking, basically what we're looking for is a lot of heterogeneity of placenta. When I say that, um, instead of the placenta being like a nice light gray everywhere, it's got a lot of black lines in it. And instead of being nice and smooth, it's got like, you know, zigzag or lobules along the end. Um, and so that's basically what we're looking for. And I think that correlates to the ultrasound where you guys see a lot of vascularity in areas where there is potentially increta and percreta. So that's like those, those vessels are the black lines that we're seeing on our MR. So when we see a lot of that, then we're worried. Is that some? And then before 32 weeks, the placenta is more homogeneous. So if you see this stuff before 32 weeks, your level of suspicion is higher. After 32 weeks, it's naturally more heterogeneous and more lobular, and so you could be overcalling a lot particularly the accreta and increta parts. Um, 
I wonder if you have any, um, uh, I use the, I have a simple rules. So oh, lot yeah. When, when I read, we read a lot of dating scans and we see a lot of ovarian um, lesions. masses, lesions on those scans. And I like to use the simple rules because they're really easy right. to follow. Do you think that they need to be modified during pregnancy? And then which ones should <clears throat> cause us to refer for MRI? Like all the indeterminants? Indeterminants over a certain size? Yeah. So interesting, Lisa and I are actually looking at the IOTA rules versus the SRU. I don't know if you know about the SRU criteria for vessel lesions, but they kind of have a set of their rules. It's more, they call them guidelines. But we're looking at those IOTA rules, and I think that uh, what we've found is that the only thing about the IOTA rules, I would say, is you know that rule about uh, you can have up to four capillary projections, and it's still not you know, considered malignant. You put it, I think, in the indeterminate or benign. I can't remember right now. But that, I think, should definitely be in the indeterminate category, and capillary projections are not worrisome. I think that I don't know how they got to that data, but that's the only one that I'm, I would say definitely I would put it in determinant. And then the nodule size has to be seven millimeters, right? I mean, I have several cases, and this is the thing. All those little papillary projections and nodules, they have time to grow, right? So you're not looking, you're probably not looking at a high-grade cancer, because those tend to be a lot more solid when they're small you're looking at some kind of borderline or low grade thing. So you, you have a little time, but you, you want to wait. So to answer your question about who should go to MR, in my opinion, I think if you ever see internal soft tissue, so irregular septations, capillary projections, any nodule, those should go to MR, because that's the group that has the malignancies in them. We actually did do a sub-analysis of very large lesions that look classic, so very large endometriomas, very large simple cysts, very large hemorrhagic cysts, and there were no borderline low grade or high grade, there were no cancers in that group. They were all neoplasms, like some of them turned out to be cystadenomas, things like that. So I think in pregnancy, um, the thing about the big lesion is you have to just make sure you see it all, right? So if you're confident you can see the whole thing, I mean, I use five, but you can use seven if you feel like seven, is, you see it all, right? Five is just something in my mind that I found in the literature, but I don't think there's a lot of data behind five. There's no number in the literature, really, other than five. But I personally think that nowadays you'd probably see seven, right, go up to seven, maybe. That's kind of your call. So the larger the lesions, I think you just want to make sure you see the whole thing. If you don't think you see the whole thing, then I'd send it to MR. If you see anything inside, if it's vascular, then you know what to do with it, right? But if it's avascular, those are the ones that I think are particularly helped by MR. Oh, Lisa. Hi. Hey. How are you? I've been talking about you. Yeah, I heard about Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a great talk. Um, I think that you you said that
where there's been a question of an, a uterine AVM. Oh yeah. I feel like I never saw one of those in my like first ten years of practice, and now yeah. we've seen like five or six or eight in the last year or two. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's something about ultrasound protocol that you think has changed that maybe can bring these up. Um, you know, it's, are there criteria for size or imaging technique that we should be thinking? Like I don't. I don't know protocol about diagnosing that. And we've sent a couple of these to MRA, MRV to try to really figure out if this isn't a uterine EVM, and then a couple of patients have ended up getting embolized. Um, but I, I don't know what your experiences with that are like. What should I mean? Know? I think that we're seeing things better because the resolution is better and your sensitivity on Doppler is better. And so that means that you're picking things up you never used to. Like, Everybody has thyroid cancer now. I don't know if you realize that. But that's because like, we can see all these little nodules, right, that we never used to see because the equipment is much better now. And so it's probably a little bit of that. And then I think that, you know, postpartum, everything's trying to get back to normal, right? And so maybe you're imaging some normal physiology that nobody's ever studied. And some portion of those patients will return to normal, but other people really have an ABM. And really, what is, I mean, an ABM, if they never get pregnant, do you have to do anything about it? I'm asking the question, because I don't know. Usually we're imaging these people because they're having abnormal postpartum. Because they have having abnormal postpartum. We're usually imaging them because we're worried about retained products. products. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, if the bleeding goes away after, you know, after you do all your imaging and whatever treatment or waiting, then great, and if not, then maybe she does have an ABN. I actually don't have a whole lot of experience in this topic, but I, I, I agree we've had a rash of them, but I think it's because we're just more sensitive. So we're picking up things like, you know, the thyroids. This would be a great, I also don't have a lot of time to take on another research. Oh yeah, that's a great project. <laughs> There's so many great projects. Just from our perspective on the yeah. surgical side, yeah. what we're trying to do is figure out, are we safe to instrument this lady right. no, I know. if she I has know. retained products? Because right. you don't want to go instrument this lady if she has That's retained just, products, right. if she has an ABM and is then going to bleed out, right? Right, so right, right, right. how do we, like, I feel right. like there should be some research on this topic, so right. we don't want to manage these ladies surgically. Yeah, and I don't know of any research on this topic. I think, you know, you know, I think, you know, watching and waiting, if she's not bleeding too much, well, if it doesn't resolve, then you have to just assume maybe it is. A, it, MR is definitely the way to help figure that out. Um, but in the end, you might just be left with, well, it was probably an ABM. If she stops bleeding after the info or after the DNC, then. But yeah, the research is needed. I totally agree. But that's a helpful point. So this would be a good candidate for a MR to follow. Ultrasound. So if you're not sure, sure, getting an MR to follow ultrasound for a suspected ABM might be a way to help us clinically. It may be. I don't know. Has it been helpful? You do. <laughs> do you think, I mean, do you think if the MR has, because honestly, we just started doing these, like, so I, I, I don't yeah. know. I think for the couple that we were concerned enough about it, where we didn't yeah. want to just sit on it and wait, yes. and the bleeding would allow us to wait, we had a couple women that got embolized yeah. uh, because of that. So in that sense, I think it was helpful. Yeah. Okay. Could you just go back two slides, just the last one? I just want the names. I missed it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys.